Hey, welcome to this installment of Low Profile. I'm Mark Lee Morrison, and my guest today is Carl Blau. Carl is a songwriting singer who, like my previous guest, Bill Elvram, grew up around Anacortes, Washington. You can't put Carl in a box when it comes to his music, which is always something fresh and original. He and I go way back. We spent months together on tour, played on each other's albums, and since he relocated his family to Pennsylvania, we still keep in touch. He just released a new album called Children of All Ages, a homespun collection of tunes for his youngest fans and their grown-ups. What would you be? Where will it go? Six many ponies on an island. Hey, did you hear? We got nowhere to go. Six many ponies on an island. Here today we talk about his musical journey, his dreams, his alternate life possibility as an oyster merchant, and the current state of independent music. And whether you're new to his work or not, you're in for a real treat today. Here's my conversation with the one and only Carl Blau. Next time around, you play the captain, I'll wear the crown. Carl, good to hear you. Mark Lee, you too. Well, how are you doing, man? Hey, good. Good to hear your voice, Sam. Uh, yeah, hanging in there. <laughs> You're in Germantown, Pennsylvania. Is that right? Yeah, been here like since December before last. So you just released an album called Children of All Ages, which you've said is your first uh, on-purpose record for children. Uh -huh. um, and, and obviously, as the title implies, grown-ups as well. And that was recorded there in Germantown, correct? Yeah, mm -hmm. in, the, in the basement here. That's where I'm talking to you from right now, yeah. That's your new studio setup? Well, it's temporary, but yeah, it's been... It's been working out, you know. Um, it was sort of unfinished when I started that record, and then through the process of the record, I started finishing the walls and painting the ceiling and stuff, and now it's it's a nicer spot to record, hang out. Um, but yeah, it's, ser it's been serving its purpose. Just, uh, you know, I thankfully I've got a, a, a neighbor that's real real forgiving you know I, there's a lot of strange sounds i made to make that album and she, <laughs> she, that she endured a lot of wild voices shrieks and i don't know just what song do you think you might have been pushing it with <laughs> oh man uh i mean I, well when you say that i was like it might immediately i went to the album before the children of all ages which is this drone album called tone kunst and and that really, I think, pushed the boundaries the most of all, all my uh, basement antics so far, where it was just like shaking the house with some really crappy amps. Yeah, you've got a lot of stuff available um, online. And so you used to do a mail order service. Uh huh. Uh, kelp monthly. Kelp was just uh, kelp was just kelp. Like I was just thinking, like this thing is okay. going to be fresh and like it's going to grow so fast because it's gonna be, like a monthly thing and like kelp grows really fast. And I was like, and I just think it's a beautiful kind of like symbol, very like melodic looking vegetable anyway um and then kelp then it was like ah, i can't really do these once a month this is crazy right so a, i went how to, long did you keep up the monthly thing? just like 14 months in a row which is you know i could have kept going but i had to keep a day job and that was the hard part because <laughs> i wasn't making any uh -huh. money off this concept and i was getting kind of sloppy with it because i was just like screw it i gotta get this out on time and so then I just named it Kelp Lunacy, and then I was kind of like, why stop there? And it became Kelp Lunacy Advanced Plagiarism Society. 
because I was just <laughs> like, what the heck? And claps. So then claps became the name of it. And they would came out there. Then only another couple dozen came out after that or something. Um, but over the next 10 years or something. Yeah. And I, I think, I think it's kind of the same series. I'm doing it through Bandcamp now. Um, just putting out these records, throwing them behind me. And you're calling that fanship freshwater. Yeah. Fanship freshwater. Yeah. The concept is just like, Hey, like if all my fans across the world could buy me a cup of coffee once a year, I could probably float off that, you know, and just dedicate my time to music. A few years back, uh, Bella Union Records put out an album of yours called Introducing Carl Blau. And I gotta say, that's a funny album title for a guy who's got 50 or 60 albums to his credit. I don't know. Something like that. Maybe there was 45 or 50. I don't know. I mean, it depends on what you count. I think I was aiming high there. (laughs) It depends on what you count. Like, those are like the solo solo efforts. And then, you know, there's a bunch of like music that I've coordinated and stuff, but I don't really count. And it's not, it's not fully me, but, um, uh, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a, it's a catch and release program just thrown behind me. But so yeah, that was a, jo- that was a fun joke to release introducing after so many, um, <laughs> and it's well in, you know, uh, introducing into, a, a different genre cause it was like a soul country covers album. Producer Tucker Martin had this concept. Well, if I needed you, would you come to me? Would you come to me and ease my pain? Well, if you needed me, I would come to you. I would swim the seas for ease your pain. In the night. It was a very much a Tucker Martin production, like, because he got these songs together that meant a lot to him and sort of used my voice to tell the story. Um, and, you know, I was paid a lot of attention for that record, but Tucker probably deserves the most, you know, uh, I mean, it was, it's his baby for sure. And I was just really happy to be a part of that and, you know, yeah. put, put the cherry on top with my voice, as it were. I mean, I didn't even play. A ton on that album it was just uh i put some harmonica here and there and like played a guitar and a song and just and then sang on it yeah and they put your face on the cover too. and they put my face on like a classic you know put your face on which, the cover. yeah which you've done <laughs> a few times here and there yeah some shrouded attempts at like my face on the cover yeah the, yeah the album cover for zebra comes to mind on the highway to take up his blinders I have to steal with one Yeah. Zebra, I so I was in your touring band for that record. Yeah, that was so great. There were some fun things that happened on that tour. I recall the band being really fun. Like um, you were playing drums with Ashley. Like you were I'm like definitely not a drummer. You were like the. T- I love your your drums are great. I mean, it was 
so you you kind of like became a dr- like one drummer together. That was really fun. And then um, uh, every the first song we would do, if, do you remember this? Was would be a um, song written that day by me on some like shards of grass or like leaves or coffee filters or scribbled. Yeah. And you uh, yeah. would get the part as you kind of walk on stage. You get the first song. <laughs> these parts. <laughs> I have a box of all these parts just in a box. I just sealed them in a box like Andy Warhol style and just forgot about them. But all those songs are sealed away. Oh, wow. They're, they're archived. They're archived. They may be burned before they're open, but, <laughs> but um, well, it's fun. Yeah, that, that Zebra album feels, even though I didn't play on it, I have such a deep connection to that particular record. And... Um, I'd say even more so than I, I, I've played on other albums of yours as well. Mm-hmm. I think my very first time in a recording studio was, uh, or first time recording in a recording studio was when you were working on Nature's Got Away. Yeah. And yeah. I barely knew you. And uh, you had me come in and uh, play electric guitar. Yeah. It's like a mockingbird eats the black a spider piece by piece to eventually lighter and his dark feathers certain bones are beats through the company moons man what a what a fun experience that was That's super uh, fun to... man Deb Nar- we're talking about Deb Narcotic Studio yeah in mm-hmm. Olympia and uh, well there were just some real glory days there um, when I think about recording I think I go to that room <laughs> like immediately um, I just always found that preferable to being in a different room recording while someone's in the other room like I just the connection yeah. there when you're like kind of right by the tape rolling tape machine rolling I just love that feeling and, uh, and there, that room had there was no separation <laughs> it's just the instruments were in the room, the people were in the room, the recording equipment, that. And uh, American Dream, let's see, Nature's Got Away. Uh, well, that Robert Sun thing we did together that I don't know, it's still on tape somewhere. <laughs> Another project that never came out, but. Yeah, that was, a, that was a fun one that we can't play a clip of. That's right, taking these old Robert Sun po- po- Robert Sund, who is another Anacortis, another Anacortis poet. He spent some time in Anacortis. Uh, his poetry was really, I was just really into that. And we just kind of had this impromptu recording session. It took a whole evening where we recorded like 40 something tracks. Or something. I don't know. It was like, just kept ro- kept the tape rolling and the pages turning. It was really fun. Yeah. It was a long night. If I remember. That was a long night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Um, but that, that reminds me of a lyric. Uh, you were just speaking of Maharican Dream which is an album that came out in 2014. Um, And in the song Chattanooga, you say, as an artist, I leap before I look like an ink spill that's longing to become a book. That's very representative of your method, as far as I can tell. Yeah. As an artist, I leap before I talked to Phil Elvum recently and he mentioned that your four track recordings from the 90s were a big influence on him personally. And I'm wondering where you were coming from when you started doing your own recordings. And uh, 
I guess, uh, how, how did you think that was going to play out versus how it's gone half a lifetime later? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, the f- I, think, I don't know how much my methods have changed in a way because I, I had this theory early on that if I just improvise onto the tape as I'm recording kind of whatever part it is I'm just doing this response track to kind of then if I do that for like 60 years I will get really good at that (laughs) and I'll be able to come up with music you know just off the cuff and and make stuff sound really good off the cuff you know because it just I would have some kind of a method at that time when early on recording four track and stuff I was trying to make something I'd never heard before. That was like my goal. Like, oh yeah. Just to make something I, and so my early stuff just goes all over the place because I'm just trying to be really in the moment and make something that I hadn't heard yet. And I was into some experimental music finally, but I mean, it took me like the Red Hot Chili Peppers get, to get out of Van Halen, to get out of Phil Collins. There's so much more happening in underground music and I just wanted to be a part of that the kind of underground music that was exciting and, and breaking ground and, you know, and then, and around that time I'm getting exposed to like Arrington, Dady Niso, uh, old time religion, Another friend of the show, old time religion comes to town to Anacortes and, you know, Phil and I are just kids just getting our minds blown. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, as I'm sort of, getting open to music enter Brett Lunsford into my life and um and sort of and showing me about Olympia Washington and all the amazing underground music happening there and then things really blew open through that lens and that would be like 94 95 were you like performing shows and stuff in before that or uh yeah uh uh-huh yeah yeah, I had a band called Captain Fathom that was playing shows regularly, like a jam, jam band, basically. I was a bass player in that band and sang as well. You're not just another star. Stars don't have the wings to spread out to your sides. Feathers will burn before the wings connect. stuff that makes me cringe now a little bit but it's it was uh-huh. a really fun band to play and we had these awesome dance parties we just played dance music and uh, the community would go to these would be like at the local grange hall when was the first time that somebody else put out one of your recordings i mean i guess that would be a uh, tape release like a, i think it was like a 50 run tape release or something like that but it was really exciting to me to have someone else printing my tapes. That must have been like mm-hmm. what, 96 or something, I want to say. That was 96 or 97. And, but um, that, yeah, that kind of felt huge. And then Marriage Records, I put out something with them, I think about the same time that I put out the K album. So then uh, for the Beneath Waves, the first K release, that was 2006. And what was the marriage release? And the marriage release was dance positive. You don't have to test your strength for no thanks. You don't have to prove your strong all night long. Wrestling with demons almost got you pinned. Walk away from Right. Um, yeah. Songs of Brett Lunsford, Buddy Brett. Um, I was kind of putting Brett's lyrics into a different format of like dance inspired, but it's just kind of really freaky some stuff. It's very dub influenced too. Dub, yeah, dub influence. Yeah. The covers of those, like spray painted and letter pressed. Yeah. So even though someone else was releasing it, you were in the physical manufacturing. Yeah, a lot of the early stuff I was just all handmade. I just really loved that feeling. I wanted, I wanted that handmade feeling to like people would touch it. Like it's like a work the artist made, like kind of through and through. I just enjoy that when I when I 
from, from other people when I wanted to do that. Your family was involved, and I'm presuming is involved, in the oyster industry. Uh-huh. Yeah. Did you ever think that uh, that was going to be a life path for you? I maybe considered it briefly over like six months or a year when I was working there in the early 2000s, um, late 90s. I guess it was just on the cusp of that um, millennium change. And I was just, I was working there and I was just like, man, this is a real honest j job. And I, I really appreciate the hard work. Um, and, but then, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I love my family, but uh, I don't know if I want to work with them every day. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's, they, uh, I'm just like, I just get these flashes of what would it be like to like have job security, you know? Um, yeah. It keeps haunting me, uh, that feeling. And uh, like now I'm, I'm oh, just yeah. about to go to work in a couple weeks here for this TV show thing where I'm going to be like a plasterer and like a hod carrier on the set, which is like mix mixing the plaster. And you know, that's going to be a dedicated amount of time for the next few months. Who knows how long and it'll be like a chunk of change to sit on and I'll have to put the brakes on recording music. And I get a little sad when these kind of situations come up and I have to, not focus on music for a while but i mean maybe that tension you know there's some merit to that tension but i'd like to see that just change i'm put i'm putting it out there yeah i every time i hear something new by you i think oh oh here we go this is the breakout record <laughs> hey man that's cool i mean uh it was fun to make the kids album i thought i thought that turned out it was like i don't i worked on a um digital format um, this time making it on my computer and I was just a little bit concerned about that being not as vibey as tape, but you know, I feel like doing the kids album on kind of made sense to just get, go real kind of clean on the computer in the way of just, I don't know. I just got, was able to get goofy on there and mess around with it, um, in yeah, a different way and tracks. infinite tracks. And so I just got real out, real tracky on some of it it was super fun It was a super fun record to make, and I, I feel like it's uh, that could be a breakout record. If but I don't know how to get it in front of people, and I've kind of already started to run out of gas of like promoting the thing. <laughs> I because I'm just like on to the next. I'm like I'm I gotta work on the next thing. Um, I'm writing a bunch of songs right now, and that's just taking all my time. And I still haven't figured out how to give the attention, you know, post making an album to like get it out in front of people enough to maybe tip the scales so it's partly my fault maybe that, that you can't uh, slow down there there are no breaks so yeah on to the next thing i've just finished a uh, lovers without borders uh it's not finished yet we're dialing in the details but it, but all the songs are there like a greatest hits for this band lovers without borders which was my band for about four years there 2013 to 15 or 16 and it was super fun i played sax in that band and sing and then Alex Parrish plays guitar and Jessica Vaughn plays drums and it's the three piece. Lucifer stands at the Rio Grande with inner tube, with lotion. Gonna put it in the water, pray to heaven's star. She will lead him to the ocean through Las Cruces, Nuevo Laredo. He knows a
It's super fun music, and uh, I'm really excited to. We're gonna put it up on the you know typical channels, and it's gonna be beautiful. Right. What I like about Lovers Without Borders is it's really light, and um, but makes you think at the same time. It's, it's bubbly, fun, party music kind of, um, and I feel like we can't lose sight of play right now. You know, got to keep yeah keep. Um, our eyes on the prize. It was visually really fun to see you because you're usually wielding um, generally like a guitar or a bass uh, while you're singing. And that was really fun because you were able to just kind of roam free and dance and then stop and play the sax every once in a while. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I first saw Lovers Without Borders perform, you uh, you were rocking... A mullet completely non ironically <laughs> and uh it really lent to the vibe of that band it, it just felt like uh like time traveling to simpler times yeah yeah simpler times <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally yeah alex there's something about alex Parrish's lyrics too that are just really resonate with me and i i just i think it's this wit but combined with a sort of like inclusiveness of different kinds of ways of being and just being like, just sort of, I don't know. It's just a, uh, it's real fresh. His lyrics are super fresh. Um, yeah, it's that band is super, really fun. I, I miss live music in general, but yeah, there's something about getting out from behind the guitar that, that, that is really fun and, um, getting out from behind instruments. It's freeing. Yeah, it's freeing. Because I think when people go to see a typical, not tip, you know, whatever, I don't want to belittle it, but a guitar player singing, it's like a certain box the music goes in your mind and you just kind of, you know, you can't help it. You just, you put, you put the experience into a box. Um, but someone has to do real, something really unique on the guitar or with their voice to kind of break you out of that box. Right, yeah. Uh, I think I don't think that's intentional. Yeah. But it's just what what we do naturally. Right. It's just cuz it's so t- kind of uh, it's just a typical scene so we kind of there's some information that I mean you can, you, you can use that as a jumping off point to reach people too cuz people are so used to the guitar. You can you can reach you can get to that part of their mind and actually and reach people too if you have something to say. Maybe there's something to that psychologically. You've done so much work under your own name and then with these collaborative bands, but you've also done a lot of great work um, as a supporting role. Um, Let's say for a few years there, you were playing bass with Earth for a while, correct? Yeah, yeah. We rehearsed and then we took some songs to the studio and then we did some improvising and that became Angels of Darkness, Demons of Light, two volumes, that which yeah. we did, we did uh, made in, in kind of the same stroke. Goldson too, the four of us just got in the studio and uh, and made these tracks together. Really, yeah, she's really a fun, terrific cellist music. that yeah, she, plays with a lot of people. She's a wonderful cellist and just and her improv. I mean, her improv playing is. I mean, that's what she does. She improvises, and it's just uh, it's real otherworldly. And uh, so it was a lot of fun. It was a kind of a weird dream. Like I wouldn't have thought that would happen to me. I remember, uh, I remember looking at the earth to album cover in college and just being like terrified of this band because <laughs> it was like <laughs> you lifted the cd off and they're like they're back behind you know the guns are pointed at you you and i <laughs> just like whoa 
But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that was my first kind of time experimenting with like marijuana and stuff, just listening to those Earth and Built to Spill and stuff, 90, 1993, 94. But uh, yeah, the. Uh, that, so yeah, I, if you told me then I would be playing with that band, I don't think I would have believed it. But yeah, it's it was it's a pretty mellow era for Earth. Um, mm-hmm. And then we we toured in Europe and in the U.S. And yeah, that was a cool right. that was a cool little little uh, era there. Um, and you had yeah. a pretty steady gig with uh, with Laura Veers and Laura Veers over the years. Yeah, yeah, I was still working with Laura. Her new record's coming out. That I play a lot on, actually. I do a lot of different instruments on it and singing. Yeah, I've been on a bunch of her records, and we toured over the 2000s umpteen times together, <laughs> literally. Um, and, uh, yeah, Your Heartbreaks is another band that I've been producing those records and playing drums on. And, yeah, it's so funny to look back with you on all this stuff it's it seems like a seems like a lot's happened in the last 20 years it really adds up doesn't it (laughs) yeah it kind of adds up so you've been on a handful of labels you know we've already talked about like k records know your own marriage uh Bella Union, who put out Introducing and uh, Out Her Space by you. And, um, but you've also released so much more material independently on your own. And a lot of people say that record labels are, you know, they're dead or they're, they're not relevant anymore. What, what do you think about that? Do you, you still I mean, like working with labels? I mean, I think, I think, uh, what labels have is um, a camaraderie with other, and like with often they have a camaraderie with uh, media organizations or like you know people mm-hmm. on those media teams, and they have a camaraderie with other musicians too. So the thing about getting on a label is you get you know you might adopt some audience from that's that's you know adopts stuff the label puts out so it's like you're getting exposure through that by getting their stamp you know like stamp of approval so that can be great for you know it could be worth a lot i mean i think as an artist you just kind of have to weigh the value of various things and if in your scene you don't have a label presence you sh- you know you should start some kind of a uh companionship with other like-minded musicians and designers and people who just want to be involved in, in a project together um yeah like a network network yeah and and uh because it's just too many hats to wear on your own you know i just i don't really wish the current music environment on anyone to just go it alone you know there's just so much to do if you can get together with other like-minded musicians and people and just divvy up the work you know um and and come together by giving your stamp of approval you know to those to those people in your group and and working in the way that a label kind of works in that way i could see that being huge in so many different pockets that i know of around the country like the northwest for example and i think that's the idea you know you just band together Now, your instrumentation is just all over the place. Like we've talked about, you're playing sax, guitar, you, you know, you whatever, whatever you can gravitate toward. Um, if you were going to record an album with one instrument, and you got, you know, you got a month to work on it, mm-hmm. what are you going to take? Oh yeah, I got this. I'm going to build a seven-string, like. Ethiopian style harp and it's I don't know if you've ever seen these I don't even remember what they're called but you play them by holding the back of the string muted with your left hand and then you're strumming all the strings with your right hand like with a pick or your fingers or whatever and you let off the ones that you want to hear 
Oh, wow. That's cool. I'm going to make an electric one. I'm just, I'm starting to make one right now. And I want to write, I definitely want to write a record on it. And I just think visually it's interesting. It's, it's on like a long staff. It looks like a, like a mariner's spear. I'll take the first week to build it. And then this thir- three weeks after that, I'll, I'll write the record and record it. <laughs> it's, it's a, I don't even, <laughs> I've been wanting to do this for a while. And I've been practicing the guitar in this way of like the way that this thing's played. And I'm, I'm ready to, to learn. I'm ready to start. I th- I just figure, you know, um, I, it, um, you, people took the electric guitar in all these different ways, you know, and just so cool what all the things that happen with electric guitar. So I'm kind of, I want to introduce this instrument as another variety that could be messed with in that way of like, it's open. Just what do you want to do with it? Yeah. That sounds great. It's kind of a percussion kind of instrument. A... Uh-huh. Yeah, it's sort of like the opposite of how say, a piano works. Push right. down on the strings you don't want. Right. You push. Yeah. Right. You let go of the strings you want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I should look up what that's called. Well, Carl, I'm officially giving you a month to <laughs> to get that done. I'm in the middle of another record. I it took me a little longer, but uh, oh, okay. but yeah, but that but that's it's it's just it's one of the it's it's like I can see it a little bit in the distance, but but yeah. What I was half expecting you to say was a keyboard that you've been featuring heavily oh. in the last couple years. Yeah. 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 The DJX. Well, I, and I've I, already done whole albums on the DJX, so I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, if there's a guard, above, uh, no, uh, sorry, not if there's a guard above. I did, that did heavily feature the, the, but the one I did pretty much all that keyboard was the one before the raise the lowered. And uh, so that's just all like that all DJX and DJX best keyboard best hundred dollar keyboard. Yeah, I was happy to hear it on Children of All Ages. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I was real happy to hear it on If There's a Guard Above. Uh, and yeah, um, let's let, let's hear a clip of If There's a Guard Above. The gist acting so mean, try to cover up this meaninglessness. I take a hint from the scene, monkey in the tree, throwing up a fist. But I, I insist there's work to be done. Not a game that soon will be won in the gray area. That's where I make my rules. In the gray area. That's where I keep my tools. In the gray area. Gray area. I like I I like the song. It's um I had this about a bunch of things happening to uh, our state of this co- the country. And uh, first thing that happened was like, people painted the White House like all different kinds of colors. And then, uh, and they, well, they marched in on Washington DC. Then they marched back to Philadelphia and to rewrite the constitution and kind of do away with the old one. And uh, the new constitution, they decided to call the country gray area and <laughs> a little dream spin, spin I had off the song of like gray area um, just because it was like a melting pot you know just to just to like talk just have in the name the fact that we're all making a go of like living together here and respecting all, everything all, all walks <laughs> in the gray I'm 
working on some like cosmic country tunes now. Um, nice stuff to. I've got this idea. It's just from you know, the the music I'm hearing, of like the directions of like hip hop meets country music. You know, it's like real gnarly country stuff. Um, I mean, it's got a country twang to it, but it's got like beats and. I don't know. I'm hearing something in there, but I'm hearing hearing drone elements too, and steel guitar. So there's like a beat, but there's drone, but there's like a drawl in the singing too. And I just have these elements swirling around in my brain. I've been writing songs to go with this feeling. Okay, <clears throat> where are you getting this drawl from? I don't know. It's just a, this voice I've been kind of working on since the introducing, I guess. It's this kind of country right. country approach to my voice. You kind of you followed up that uh, introducing uh, a couple years later. I guess just last year you had a single come out called Twilight. Mm-hmm. And uh, like at least production-wise, uh, very much a continuation of that sound. Over by the wildwood, hot summer night. Uh, it was a song sense. that we did. It was a song we held back um, from the record because it was like it was like either that or it was the other Tom T. Hall song, the um, Homecoming, and I just couldn't see Homecoming not on the record. So it was just like I, yeah. I trying to put. I wanted to. I mean, we we agreed we wanted to push it towards the country. Um, sound, sure. So we kept we kept the Tom T. Hall, and yeah, more Tom T. Hall the merrier, right? <laughs> oh, love Tom T. Hall. Yeah, you know that. I have all of his books. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've read any of his books. Yeah, mostly. Uh, yeah, they're they're fiction. Yeah. They're usually pretty pretty folksy, humorous uh -huh. stories. Uh -huh. He even gets into a little bit of sci-fi sometimes. No way. Oh, my oh yeah. Gosh. Wow. He's got a He's got a good time travel book. Whoa. Called what? It's called What a Book. Really? Yeah. Oh man, that sounds incredible. Highly recommend that. That reminds me that uh, speaking of books to read and talking about introducing Lang Martin Jr., who is uh, Tucker's dad, just came up out with his book. Um, so his biography of moving to Nashville as a songwriter, um, and you know. Raising a family by writing songs. <laughs> pretty uh -huh. pretty incredible. I haven't finished that yet, but I, I have started it. It's it's a fun ride so far. You you did one of his tunes on introducing, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. We did Let the World Go By. Yeah, beautiful tune. Such a great tune. Yeah. So um uh, what what are we what are we looking for next in the world of Carl Blau? I am uh, super psyched to do another record with Tucker Martin, and uh, that's you know things are on hold right now, of course. So might have to get creative on how that actually happens. Um, I want to get into film and TV, uh, create stories for for you know screenplays and, and television, and that's just more. 
kind of long term. Yeah. Have you have you done much narrative writing before? No, and it terrifies me. Um, mm -hmm. I so, but I just need to get back into the mindset that I have cultivated with my music and just go for it, you know, and leave the editor outside for those times when I'm going for it, you know, and just come back later. And so most of the writing I've done so far is like, there's not a lot of narr narrative happening yet. It's all like storyline and things that kind of happen with the story. And so that those details are really interesting to me and like elusive, but you know, it's often how it works. Like the thing that's your Achilles heel, heel kind of becomes your strong suit when you spend so much time with it. So I'm open-minded yeah. that I can develop my, my, uh, my voice as it were in that way. And I've, but, uh, yeah, I've got, so like, we'll see what happens, but, but yeah, I, I guess I'm going to be in Philly for a while and just, uh, working on, uh, more music and, um, I've got like endless ideas with, with, with music, but it's just kind of all dictated with time that I get involved, the time that I have. And so, yeah, I don't know. Just going to try to keep, uh, keep being Carl, man. <laughs> That's... Keep being Carl. Yeah, can't stop that. Um, yeah, man. And uh, yeah, what is it that who, I think it's uh, what Malcolm Gladwell? His thing he says about uh, a thousand hours of practice to become an expert. Uh huh. So, God, you you got to be an expert like a few dozen times over by now. Of the of like being Carl. Of being Carl. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. So yeah, if you practice that and if that yeah that's a great that's a good way to look at it yeah i'm uh i'm going you know what one cool project i have in front of me is going through this huge box of tapes cassette tapes um just i have i have so much like you know what i didn't tell you this but the other day i found a skrill meadow tape at the thrift store i didn't buy it because i already have that tape and I was oh, wow. so excited about someone else getting this tape. But there was a whole vein of like music from Olympia. I was like, oh, someone moved to town and, and you know, got rid of their cassettes. But Lighten their load. Yeah. yeah. But it was so fun wow. to see Skrill Meadow in the local, like, tiny little thrift store. <laughs> I was That's like, crazy. oh, Markley made it. <laughs> <laughs> I found my own music it's in a, a thrift store one other time. Uh huh. And yes. <laughs> uh, like you know 10 years after it had come out i was just like what is this doing here so uh that's but that that was always the dream so yeah you're, you're correct when you say i've made it that's always been my goal that's <laughs> the, the thrift stores where i've found some of my favorite music yeah i have the i have the most incredible thrift store for for music and the tapes are like 10 for a dollar it's amazing yeah i oh, i, I, I have just my tape collection is not suffering, but my, so yeah, I also have this giant amount of tapes of, from live tapes from recording. Cause I would just go to shows and for years I would just record every show that I went to, especially if I was playing on the show, I would record the other bands. So yeah, I, have, I got, I have like hundreds and hundreds of hours and it's like, I don't know. I'm kind of feeling it right now. Like, Going through, I think this might be my winter project, just going through and like listening to stuff, <laughs> and like yeah, maybe letting some stuff go, but and finding some gems. That's so nice when you find little audio picture, little, little snapshots, cut on cassette. Yeah, it's really special. There's such a warmth and uh, uh huh, yeah. And the bantering was kind of fun. I sort of thought it'd be fun to like collect the bantering in between. You know, the stuff people say, but also just the people milling around the room. Uh-huh. Just that feeling, you know, like a, like a, like a environmental tape of, of DIY space room noise. Oh man. I think that would be really therapeutic for a lot of people. These yeah. Days like it kind of ASMR. Of yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Ooh, that's coming out. That's coming down. down all you fanship freshwater members listening to this. <laughs> coming down yeah, the pipes definitely nice cool well um 
I I think we did it. Yeah, we we did we, we did a fair amount, we, right? Yeah, I think we did a show's worth. Is there a message in your heart that you want to go out on? Well, you know, um, gosh, I'm just I miss I miss everyone in the. Um, I think a lot of people probably listening to your show are like friends of mine too, and I just miss all of you so much. I don't know, like I I mean yeah, I'm over here in Philly. Don't get to see a lot of Northwest folks, but uh, yeah, here we're just in this period. I feel close to everyone at the same time, you know. Like I know we're kind of all going through this thing together, um, this isolation, and so there's almost like a closeness I feel, and I just, um, I love you all. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to say to the haters? Yeah, haters, I love you too. And uh, I don't know if you saw this coming, but um, you think you could give me a haiku about how you like a hamburger? Hmm. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I care it's coming. Tuesday. Tuesday is the place I will be waiting. I love you. Lovely. And I can really use that silence that you gave me, too. So. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Let me listen all the guests and let me know the score. Let me settle in the net. It'll make me hope for more. Make me holler. episode of low profile thanks a million to carl blau you can find a million reasons to thank him yourself by searching for fanship freshwater on bandcamp.com if you'd like to support this show and be entered into occasional giveaway drawings you can go to patreon.com slash low profile you can also check out the show's instagram at low pro podcast Stay safe, get blessed, and catch you in a couple weeks. Honey, while the sunny golden rivers flow, lose your crown and pass it down and down and down some truth. As you're drinking from the fountain, do you need more? Shelter me.